you know, 10 years ago, we talked about an online and an offline world. Yeah. And now they're so blended. Yeah. You know, people are walking around on their phones on TikTok and watching a video right, and, right, and right. sharing with a person in real life what's going on. And so, real life. See, I did it. See, yeah. I did it too. <laughs> Real versus online isn't the right um, isn't the right dichotomy. What I kind of see more is that we begin to actually have very different realities of what we experience. There are a large portion of uh, people in the United States who have very different sense of whether COVID was real, what the causes were, what the solutions were, what the what the right treatments were, and literally are living in, in different realities. We spend a tremendous amount of time collecting the dots. We need to spend just as much time in connecting those dots. And that's what Public Health Connects is all about. My name is Dr. Umer Shah. I'm the Secretary of Health for the great state of Washington. This is Public Health Connects. Hi everyone, welcome to Public Health Connects, a speaker series centered on equity innovation and engagement. My name is Dr. Umer Shah, Secretary of Health for the great state of Washington. And on today's episode, we are going to be unpacking so much about social media, the impact of social media on not just the pandemic, but society in general. We're gonna close by asking what the future looks like and what can all of us do today to build the bridges and close the gaps in our communities that have been oftentimes fractured. Joining me today is gonna to be Dr. Kate Starbird, co-founder of the University of Washington Center for an Informed Public, an institution that researches not just misinformation, but communications in general. Dr. Starbird's work is all about studying, tracking and combating myths and disinformation, and again, rumors as she prefers to call them. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today, Kate. All right, thanks for having me. So the first question is an easy one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tell us about yourself. Why, why this work, what, what, you know, what's your background? How did, how did you get here today? Okay, um, so Kate Starbird, I am an associate professor at the University of Washington. I actually started out in a related field as a PhD student somewhere in the late 2000s, uh, looking at what we now call crisis informatics, which is the study mm -hmm. of how social media are used during crisis events. Initially, we studied the pro-social things that people did using social media during a crisis event, like a natural disaster or an act of terrorism. We would actually look at how people came together to try to share information, to try to help each other, um, to volunteer uh, and and help, you know, sometimes it was neighbors helping neighbors, sometimes mm -hmm. it was people trying to help from halfway across the world. Sure. Around 2013, I was still doing a lot of work in crisis informatics, um, and I grabbed a data set um, actually during the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombings, which uh, a horrible and, and tragic event. In that aftermath, there were a lot of rumors about what was happening, and so that was the first time my team really set out to um, study how people we're trying to make sense of a complicated information space and sometimes getting it wrong, mm -hmm. um, sometimes accidentally, sometimes there was some pur purposeful spread of, of misinformation. Um, and after 2013, uh, with, with collaborators at the University of Washington, we began to build a research program that studied um, how rumors, misinformation, and then eventually disinformation uh, spread through online systems during crisis events. Interesting. Yeah. So a long history here. Of, long history. Yeah. It's been a decade now. So the Boston Marathon bombings were about 10 years ago. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because in my background, there was a lot of emergencies. And I think you're absolutely right that you start with the emergency and you're, you're responding to the emergency, but that at the same time you start to get information and rumors and you're trying to get good information out, but there's also additional information that starts to challenge what that viewpoint is. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, one of the, the, the natural things that people do during a crisis event is that we try to come together to make sense of what's happening. Mm. And we do that because we don't, as humans, like uncertainty uh, and, and anxiety. Uh, and crisis events are just, you know, characterized by uncertainty and anxiety. And so as humans, we want to get rid of that. And so what we do is we come together, we talk to each other, we share explanations, we try to share the information that we have. And sometimes we actually come up with, with, with you know, pretty accurate view of what's mm -hmm. going on, but often we get things wrong. And so 
a byproduct of that natural collective sense-making process during crisis events, a byproduct is rumors. You've used this a few times about misinformation, yeah. disinformation, and then this, this word rumors. If, if you could help maybe unpack yeah, those three, sure. that would be fantastic. Misinformation is not necessarily intentional. Disinformation is intentional, um, uh, uh, intentionally misleading. And then rumors are just unofficial stories that we tell ourselves about what's going on. Um, mm. That, you know, sometimes rumors turn out to be true, as I, as I said. Uh, often they turn out to be false. Almost always they're somewhere in between, right? There's a little bit of truth and a little bit of, of, of falsity. And, and those sort of combine um, in ways that can, again, they can be harmful, but they also can be a part of this people trying to cope with disaster events. And, and has that, do you feel that's increased? Even from our, our, our first case study, which is around the Haiti earthquake in 2010, we did see some rumors. We saw some misinformation. We saw families that were, you know, saying that they were hearing from their loved loved ones in these mm -hmm. in these demol in these crushed buildings, and it was likely they hadn't heard from them in the last couple of days. But they were saying that because they wanted the searchers to come back to their mm. to their buildings and and to search for their loved ones. So, so we, did, we did see, we saw some other folks that were intentionally spreading misinformation, but it seemed like, you know, with those first studies we did, especially in the Haiti earthquake, it seemed like such a small part of the overall social media record. Most of what we saw was pro-social, people trying to help, people trying to help, help each other, and, and, and again, their neighbors helping people halfway around the world. But over time, we began to see the, the rumors, the misinformation, and then the disinformation become an increasingly larger part of the social media record. We also saw these sort of conspiracy theories that the event mm -hmm. wasn't real, it wasn't happening, or it wasn't happening as, as, as the, the media were reporting on it. And that became an increasingly larger part of the social media record as well. So much so that around 2015 or 2016, my team began to, to kind of get a sense that, that disinformation or the intentional spread of, of falsehoods was sinking into the network Oh, I see. And, the, and the algorithms uh, on some of the social media platforms, especially Twitter, which was the one we were able to study. Why do you prefer the term rumors and not misinformation? One of the reasons that rumors are, are valuable, not just as a researcher, but also as a public health official, um, is that rumors, you know, you can, you can talk about something as a rumor before you know whether or not it's true before you know whether or not people are spreading it intentionally, you can say, hey, there's something here, um, it's information, it's running counter to maybe what, what uh, officials are saying. It, it could turn out to be true, it could turn out, out to have value, um, but, but it also is, is likely false, there's some uncertainty and it's not verified yet. It allows you to begin to act on something without putting one of those sort of negative labels on top of it. And it also, rumor allows you to say, you know, there might be something valuable that this audience is going to tell us. In fact, not there might, there is something valuable. Even if the rumor is wrong, it's telling you something about the fears of that, of the people that are spreading it, about their concerns. Um, and, and even if it's you know, almost completely wrong, there's some, there's some information as a public health official or as a researcher anywhere else, there's something valuable in that. And so I think it, 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 it allows you to approach an audience without as much judgment, with more empathy, more understanding of, of, of why you know, people might be sharing that information. What's the root cause? Why is this a rumor out there, which may be a concern or uh, some, some other reason that a rumor is being spread? Indeed, and so you know, in, in, in our society where, where people are able to participate in, mm. on, in ways with information in ways that we never had before, it recognizes that agency that people have. Mm. When we apply the you know, labels and, and kind of you know, apply this sort of like, oh, you're, you're a problem, you're spreading the wrong, the, the wrong information. And you also kind of suggest, oh, you have the wrong information, we have the right information. I think that takes away agency, and people don't like to have, to, to have their agency taken away. So how do you allow for the fact that, you know, these people have agency, they're, they're, they're trying to gather information, recognize that that's a natural process, and at the same time sort of approach in a way, okay, let's, let's talk about what you're going through, and, and let's try to give you information that we have that can help you come to a, a better understanding without just d d disregarding you know, the, the, the agency they have and the information that they're trying to bring to the table. Really interesting in the sense that you know, we have nearly 3,000 local health departments across the country. You have all these agencies that are in the middle of a crisis, right? A crisis is occurring, something is happening, and now they're 
having to be on the same page and to do that at a time where you know, the community is anxious or concerned. It, that seems quite daunting out of a task. And where there's uncertainty. Yeah. And there's uncertainty of the, of know, the response. Yeah, yeah. I've watched, you know, the things we know in minute one are very different from minute 10 and, right. and an hour or two hours later. There's always that un uncertainty. And so um, those are hard conditions to communicate within. But, you know, uh, allowing, allowing for the fact that, that that uncertainty is there and kind of um, understanding that, that, that information is going to change and acknowledging that sometimes the officials get it wrong, right? Yeah, right. And, and so in an effort to be almost too like, oh, we have to have these simple messages and we have to, you know, be authoritative and make sure people trust it, I think we actually maybe got to a place where, where people are trusting those messages less. So I wanna, I wanna ask you a little bit more about uh, the pandemic yeah. in just a moment. So again, Public Health Connects, we're with Dr. Kate Starbird, uh, an expert in communications at the University of Washington, having a conversation about information, misinformation, disinformation, rumors, and communications in general. So my question is really um, about what you've seen in this prolonged pandemic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you have 20 minutes to answer that question, but I think there, there were so many things about the pandemic that, that were such a perfect storm for the spread of rumors, misinformation, and disinformation. Early on, and actually for, for, for months, and in, in to some extent continuing today, there was uncertainty. And I already talked about how like uncertainty really dr powers the rumor mill. And there was so much uncertainty, it was persistent. It makes the, the information conditions ripe for people to try to figure things out, come up with alternative explanations. Um, on top of that, uh, people had to, had to leave public spaces. They went all in, indoors to their homes and they went online. As a researcher, in March of 2020, we knew mm. that the pandemic, like the vaccine release, was, was going to be part of the worst part of the pandemic. Uh, Interesting, and we, we yeah. already knew that the messaging around that um, would be contested, uh, that there were already sort of active online communities that were going to um, attempt to undermine messaging around vaccines and um, we didn't know exactly how, how that was going to take shape, but, but it was, we understood that that, that was going to be a, 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 one of the most significant challenges of the pandemic. So it's interesting. March of 2020 is very early in the process because if, you know, just, just a reminder to everybody that Operation Warp Speed and the, and the, um, the, the continued push to get vaccines developed and be able to, to get them out to communities, that wasn't really until the winter. Yeah. You're talking about a nine month prior looking ahead, being able to anticipate potential challenges on that, on that trust piece. Yeah, because we already knew that there was an active anti-vaccine community mm. in online environments. And we knew that it both had sort of proponents in the far left and that the far right was also in, in the United States was also picking up those messages. As a researcher, I think there was a, a few of us that that are disinformation and misinformation researchers that have actually come into it from studying anti-vaccine com anti -vaccine communities. That wasn't me, but I have mm -hmm. colleagues who, who did that. And, and they were already saying, if vaccination is going to be a solution to this pandemic, we've got a problem here because misinformation about vaccines is going to be a huge challenge. Mm. And Interesting. That was, you know, as as soon as as soon as people began to even mention that that vaccines were under development. We're here at Public Health Connects with Dr. Kate Starbird, expert in communications at the University of Washington, talking about information. So, we talked a lot about this pandemic. What could we have done? I, I'm not trying to armchair quarterback, yeah. but, but I guess I am. What could we have done better to be prepared? It's a hard question for me to answer because I'm not sure that there was anything that one group of people or one profession mm -hmm. could have done to have mitigated the damage of, of rumors and mis disinformation during the pandemic. Again, the conditions were just so ripe for the spread of rumors yeah. due to the uncertainty and everything else and, and just the information conditions at the time where you know so many people going online and those online environments at the time were wired for the spread of mis and disinformation. You brought up a really good point. Um, conditions were ripe. Yeah. 
um, platforms ha were wired. Yeah. So how do algorithms play out? What, what, what would be your way of describing an algorithm and, and how does that work and how should we, the audience, think about the use of algorithms and is it a solution? Is it, is it part of the problem? In social media systems, um, the, the recommendation algorithms do a couple of things. One of those is they determine what order content appears in your feed. And so to mm. determine what, what, what shows up on top and what kind of isn't as visible. Uh, and they also um, give recommendations about who to follow and, and who to watch for, for more information. So one of the things that happens is that these algorithms are sort of optimized to keep us in the seats, to keep us using the platform, to keep mm -hmm. us scrolling, to keep us engaged. We could say very simplistically, algorithms give us more of what we like, but really algorithms give us more of what we engage with. And that can be because it makes us happy and it's puppies, or it can be because it makes us angry, or it can be because it's sensational and it makes us interested. And so one of the things about you know, uh, a crisis event or a pandemic or something else where there's a lot of uncertainty, there's misinformation, is the misinformation often is more interesting mm. than the truth. Uh, and so, you know, a good conspiracy theory, hey, that looks like a Hollywood movie, right? I'm going to pay more attention to that. And so the algorithm gives us more of, of that kind of content. We paid attention to the last one. We might have liked it. We might, it might have made us angry. They give us more of that. So you're not going to spread a rumor that that, that's not interesting or that doesn't emotionally activate sure. you. And so what happens is, is we're more likely to engage with something that, that emotionally activates us. And in fact, mis and disinformation often have that same property as well. And so there's just this sort of reinforcement in, in, in our vulnerabilities of certain kind of information and that the way that these platforms are, are designed. So I know in the past you've said these are almost living in different realities, uh, right. right? And you're trying to reconcile your reality of your, your life with, with what's happening out there. And at the same time, there's a, a reality uh, difference between online and what is in real life. You know, 10 years ago, we talked about an online and an offline world. Yeah. And now they're so blended. Yeah. You know, people are walking around on their phones on TikTok and watching a video right, and, right, and right. sharing with a person in real life what's going on. And so real life. See, I did it. <laughs> I did it, too, uh, in, in the physical world. Right. right. And so I don't think, you know, real versus online isn't the right um, isn't the right dichotomy. What I kind of see more is that we begin to actually have very different realities of what we experience. And if you asked people, there, 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 are, there are a large portion of uh, people in the United States who have a very different sense of whether COVID was real, what the causes were, what the solutions were, what the, what the right treatments were, and literally are living in, in different realities. Um, when we watch it from the scientific side, they'll cite different papers uh, to say, okay, masks worked or masks didn't work. Um, they'll cite different work to say, oh, vaccines are harmful versus that vaccines have efficacy. And right. And so we actually are seeing people live in, in very different realities. And it makes us hard to, to come together um, to make good decisions. And it's also we see it fracturing families and and um, and friendships because we just don't have this common ground in part because of how we've been getting our information. Public Health Connects, Dr. Kate Starbird here. I'm Dr. Umair Shah, Secretary of Health for the Great State of Washington. What can we do now? What are the solutions? What, you know, is, is it all fractured? Is it all broken? How would you answer a question about where we are and really looking at how do we solve for the future? I, I don't want to be all do, doom and gloom. I mean, there are some signals that, um, that are that are good in, at, the, yeah. at the current moment. Media literacy, digital information literacy is higher across the board. People are, are coming to understand these things. I, that doesn't mean they're going to correct false beliefs in the past, but I do think across the society we're, we may be less likely to fall for a new thing. Mm. Um, the problem is is that, that we've dug in on certain beliefs about what we've already experienced and, and have those sort of separate realities due to that. A couple of years ago, most, of, uh, most people were primarily using two or three uh, major platforms. Now it's spread across a lot mm. of different platforms. I think as researchers and journalists uh, and people that care about transparency and understanding what's going on, it is much harder today to understand what's going on on social media than it was three years ago. Uh, in part because of that sort of fractured and distributed nature of, of just the activity across multiple platforms. But also we have a case where platforms like Twitter and Reddit 
that have historically been transparent with their data have moved away from transparency, and we no longer have access to them as researchers. Um, and so that's actually one of the things that concerns me. Um, the flip side of that is that people are using different platforms, mm -hmm. and there may be fewer people all converging around the same false claim at once. Uh, and, and so, but th these are sort of speculation right now. Right, right, right. We don't know how this is playing out. We don't, we don't really have a great thumb on the pulse of what's going on right now. Um, in social media spaces because of the changes in the last few months. Actually. The Surgeon General has talked about social isolation and yeah. the lack of connectedness yeah. and loneliness and yeah. things of that nature. And then you know, obviously that's where you get online and you know if you're not able to physically connect or be in a place where you can socially connect with somebody in person, you do it online. How does that in-person approach really change? Or does it, I, I would assume it does, but how does that, is that part of the solution? It, it may indeed be. I think we've known since the 1970s that in yeah. online environments or like in digitally mediated environments that we, that the same social norms don't necessarily 70s. Hold. Yeah. It was, the early so like TV? Like e, uh, or, email between oh, professors. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Would be, it, it could get um, ratcheted up in terms of sort of, uh, what they call it, flaming. Uh, they had a, a different word back then for yeah. it, but that people would act in ways that they probably wouldn't in, in, in person, and it could become harsher language. And part of it, you, you know... That's 50 it, years. That's yeah, a, long a long time. Okay. Um, wow. But there is something to be said about, you know, being in person, being able to, you know, if, if a conversation goes wrong, you can actually reach out and, and you know, there's a human touch there if you sure. know each other well enough. Right, right, right. Um, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, you know, there's, there's those kinds of things. Uh, I do think it's really important um, to to connect when we can in person, I think there's there's still a real value to that, especially when we're having these hard conversations. So for me, when I think about sort of loved ones where I have a, sh a, a non shared reality, um, certainly uh, uh, sending emails back and forth with links to mm. our favored websites and what they're saying about an issue is not productive, uh, and. Um, and even having sort of textual conversations, I think not yeah. as productive as going over there having a conversation. We, we talk about hard things, we don't always agree, um, but keeping those bridges open uh, and, and, and trying to sort of rebuild um, some of the relationships that maybe became fractured when not only were, did we live in separate realities due to the information, but we couldn't see each other. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't have those, those in-person moments. and you know, give my loved one, uh, you know, a yeah. hug at the end of a hard conversation as opposed to, you know, hanging up the phone yeah, <laughs> or yeah, something yeah. else, which wasn't, wasn't as, as we, productive. You bring something up that, that now I'm curious about, which is the next generation, kids. Yeah. Are we seeing some evolution of how even the next generation is viewing things? Because, uh, you know, I'll tell you, my, my kids, texting is the way. I always say the kids are going to be all right. Uh, I think you know there definitely are some risks and harms around using technology, and and, and parents should be, definitely be aware of those. When I think about the problems of mis and disinformation, that's not the group that I think of first, mm. right? This is a K through 99 problem, and I think if we can keep the world around long enough <laughs> that the young people can take charge, I think we're going to be okay. <laughs> Uh, the, there, that's good to know. That's that, good, to know. good to know. Yeah, yeah, there's hope here. <laughs> I, I'm glad to be able to, 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 to share that message. And I think that's brilliant because I think there's a lot that, that we, we, can learn. we olds yeah. can learn from, from the young people. And again, I just think if we can, we can keep these things working uh, and, 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 and keep, you know, keep, keep our country going, our world going, I think, I think the young people are going to be okay. I just want to remind everybody, Public Health Connects, uh, we're talking to Dr. Kate Starbird, uh, a professor and expert in communications and unpacking so much of what we're seeing across the public health world and uh, across our country and our globe. This is really a global issue as it well. Is, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. We talked about kids just now, but we also talked about connection and community. Yeah. And, I, and I wonder if uh, that you could uh, talk about the importance of, let's say, in-person connections or uh, community health workers, yeah. promotoras, you know, people of a certain connection point, a vantage point, somebody that you trust, somebody that, it, it could be a provider, right? You, you trust your doctor, your nurse. And do we have to invest more in these in-person or these community-based approaches that, that really help engender trust? Yeah, I think, I mean, 
every community is different. Yeah. And, and how we draw different communities. We're all part of multiple communities That's as, true. as well. That's true. Good point. Right. It turns out, you know, in online environments, there are people we trust in online environments, but it's hard. It's hard to even know if that person is who they say they are. Mm -hmm. um, and in person, you know that this person at least, you know, sees you. They're part of your community. They are who they say they are, pretty likely. Um, so there's just such a value for for reaching out and, and developing um, relationships uh, that involve that that component where where people can see your authenticity, they can see you as a three dimensional person that's not just this this role and a title, but a person, and they can you know you can talk mm -hmm. about you know family or common experiences. There's just there's just such a, a value there. I absolutely think that that in person um, community based communication has got to be part of uh, a, a big a big part of. Uh, successful public health strategy. And also that that connection with uh, community in the sense that, you know, like a promotora may be from that community mm -hmm. who is also now coming back to champion certain concepts as well. So I think, I'm sure there's a connection that, that, that happens with, you know, you, you're just more trusting of somebody that is, is familiar to you. Well, time has gone very fast. I have one more question. I'm gonna tee it up here. Um, what's on the horizon technology-wise. We're hearing a lot about generative AI. Um, I'm not even sure everybody knows what that means. But what's on the horizon? What are, we, what are we looking, what should we be thinking about as we look ahead? As researchers, one of the things we're thinking about with generative AI are, A, these technologies can be used to create disinformation at scale mm. very cheaply. So we're seeing a new tool potentially for the intentional spread of misleading content. And then additionally, these generative AI tools, they are very good at creating plausible content, but they have no concern for whether it's actually true or not. And so the, the potential to sort of accidentally spread misinformation if we rely on these generative AI tools. For researchers, we're really kind of beginning to study that intersection and, and, and think about um, also ways to, to use generative AI possibly in, to, to support better information um, sharing and so there's some ideas there as well. It's not all doom and gloom, but um, but certainly there are new um, new concerns with the arrival of generative AI, especially the the text-based stuff. And there's also concerns on some of the image creators as well. Wow. So challenges and opportunities. So yeah, sure. I, I definitely don't want to leave on a doom and gloom. So let's let's have something positive as we as we <laughs> finish up here. Something positive that you're looking at. I know you talked about community. You talked about connection. You talked about children, right? Yeah. You talked about the next generation. You talked about these, the tools that can be, you know, good and not so good. What yeah. gives you that glimmer of hope for the future that we are moving and transforming and transitioning to a place that, that, you know, maybe, maybe this is going to be a, as you said, all right. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I, I hope so. So I, I'm not confident, but I'm hopeful. Uh, and I'm hopeful um, for a couple of reasons. And one is just, you know, we are getting a sense that people are more aware of our vulnerabilities. Um, we are getting, seeing more commitment to things like media literacy, digital information literacy kinds of things. And, um, and there's a lot of work being done there that, uh, that I'm really hopeful sort of build, build resilience. I'm still hopeful that social media platforms will do a better job of sort of um, understanding where their designs compound issues mm -hmm. in, in, in kind of thinking about how not to get us into these like engagement based uh, rabbit holes that, that, that have been happening. And um, we have seen some movement in that direction as well. So I, 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 I think that this is a very challenging problem and, and we have to kind of come at it from all sides in order to, to really make a difference. It's not gonna be we're gonna solve it all with a new educational program or a new public health communication plan or a new platform design. But I think together with, with, with great people working on all, all these things, uh, I, I think I think we're gonna make a dent in it. Thank you so much for taking time today and spending time with us. And I know our audience will find this so valuable. And as they try to navigate these waters that are very challenging because so much, as you've said, is evolving in real time. Yeah. I just can't say enough about it this conversation. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. This has been Public Health Connects a speaker series centered on equity innovation engagement. I'm Dr. Umer Shah, until next time, signing off.